Thank you. So welcome everyone to the John Care Board meeting. The first item on the agenda is the Executive Director's Report. Susie Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have uh, two brief announcements. First, for next Wednesday's meeting, we will be hearing from the GMCB staff on non-standard qualified health plan design approval process and 2021 evaluation criteria. That's the only thing on our agenda at this point for next week. Um, the February schedule for our meetings will be published by this Friday. And that's all I have to announce. That's great. Thank you, Susan. Uh, the next item are the minutes of Wednesday, January 15th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, January 15th. Without any additions, deletions, or corrections, is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. So with that, we'll, we'll welcome our friends from uh, Diva down front. Thank you for having us back again to walk through where we are with our consent um, policies. Several of um, the board members know we were over at the legislature um, this morning, and I believe you got a copy of um, Dan Smith's uh, letter to the health the House Health Care Committee. Um, and I believe that we agree with Dan Smith's assertion that um, we've met most of the obligations, we've met all of the obligations in Act 53 um, and are prepared for the transition to the opt-out consent policy. So you've been working with us over the last few months to, to walk through the consent policy. So today, we're really gonna deliver an update on our implementation activities that have occurred um, since November when we were here last. We're gonna illustrate how our efforts will continue to serve the purposes of educating Vermonters about their rights related to their sharing of their health information and records through the Vermont Health Information Exchange. And we're gonna provide you details on how we've updated um, the health information um, uh, exchange plan um, in the context of at the addition of an amendment, uh, I'm sorry, an addendum to that plan per your recommendations the last time we were here. Uh, just to ground everyone um, in the work that we've been doing together, the legislature asked us to do these six sub-bullet points um, under Act 53. We've really, over the last few months in this, um, in this arena, have talked about them in three specific work streams. One work stream has been focused on engaging um, Vermonters in helping to guide the outreach and education. Um, and we've really worked on stakeholder engagement with both advocacy organizations and Vermonters. The second has been an, uh, that we will provide an update on the mechanisms that we've implemented, um, many of which were in concept when we were here last time, but now are fully implemented in order to allow easier mechanisms for Vermonters to opt out. And then the third work stream, as a reminder, is the evaluation work stream, and there's been some activities there too. Related to that, since we've last met, we've continued to do interviews and focus groups under the stakeholder engagement. We've developed communication um, tools and key messages um, based on the stakeholder input that we've received, and we've engaged Small Mammal, who's a communications enterprise, to help us develop materials that are accessible and follow what we've learned from our stakeholders. In addition to that, we've assessed the workflows that are needed and the policies and technology to manage the consent and vital, switching from opt-in to opt-out. We've developed training for the hotline at the vital and the office of the healthcare advocate. And we've engaged providers in the changes to the, to the policy. You will also hear that many of the opt-out mechanisms that were intended to go into place um, so that we could be prepared are now in place, including um, a hotline and a website, which is different than it had been under the opt-in policy. We've also established a stakeholder information, uh, stakeholder evaluate, we've established an evaluation committee made up of stakeholders um, who are supporting the development of an evaluation plan. Um, and we've received over 11,000 responses to the, uh, in the statewide um, patient experience survey, which included questions, um, questions around consent policy change. So at this point, I'd like to, to take an opportunity to have Maureen, who has been updating you on kind of what are, on our stakeholder engagement process, talk about the activities that they've engaged in in that work stream. Hi, um, I'm gonna just 
just start with an overview of the work since November. So the public education campaign has launched. Many of you will have seen a front porch forum post that went out on Monday, um, letting people know sort of the beginning of this story about what the health information exchange is. Um, and we have a website that it's dragging to as well. I'll get a little bit more into the tactics in the next slide. Um, advocacy organizations and other partners have committed to um, participating in the, getting the message out, and some of them have already used their channels to, to post about the health information exchange. And we've completed training with the staff of the Office of the Healthcare Advocate, so that when folks call that line with questions, they are armed with answers, um, and also know that VITAL is available as a backstop if those questions get really technical. Um, but they've been great partners and um, have been really willing to help field those calls and answer those questions. Can I make one, one clarification mm -hmm. point that came up this week? Um, while the majority of, uh, of our work to date has been framed around what we'll do before March 1st go live, that many of the educational materials and other things that you see that are built into this plan will continue past the March 1 um, deadline and we will continue efforts to inform Vermonters about the consent policy and the health information exchange and their rights therein. So what do we have up so far? Um, we have a website that's live and we'd love for you to take a look at that www.bthealthinfo.com. Um, it's really basic, it's just a couple of pages. It's never going to get complex or complicated, that's not our goal for it, but it will be built out with a couple of more resources, including the frequently asked questions section, and there will be a video that we'll be adding, so we have that media in the mix. Um, there's a communications toolkit that we are compiling. The first part of that is a social post that we've sent out to partners and that they've begun to share, as I mentioned um, a minute ago, and the remainder of that toolkit will include um, more social posts, it will include posters, it will include um, a newsletter or a blog post, it will include um, a brochure, although most of the brochures will be distributed as you know printed copies by Vital, Vital's handling all of that printing and sending it out to hundreds of organizations around the state. Um, and so that's really just gonna be a place to centralize the resources so all of our partners have one place they can go. And of course, we're always available to answer questions and help strategize, even to create custom um, executions. For instance, uh, the Pride Center recently suggested to us, I may have mentioned this last time I was here, I'm not sure, that um, Facebook Live is a great way to get the message out. They get great traction with that. And maybe we could do um, a Facebook Live video together. So we're um, also open as we develop this to doing custom work with any of the partners and advocates. The hotlines at Vital and the Office of the Healthcare Advocate are up and running, and Andrea will talk a little bit about the um, outreach or the outreach with the questions that are already getting the incoming calls. Um, and like I said, we've got one front porch forum post out in the world, and at least three more are, are planned, um, probably more than that, at least three more before March 1st, but we've got more in the package that we'll be using. And then we are working on getting um, some earned media as part of this education campaign, so news, um, using the local papers that we know folks folks really do read and um, spend some time with. So we're planning on uh, putting an article in as many local papers as possible, and then working with um, the news media, the statewide news media, um, to see if they're interested in getting this message out as well and covering it. So, just a really quick preview here. Really the best way to see this is to look at the website itself, but this is what it might look like if you were looking at it on a desktop or laptop. It's absolutely mobile optimized. We know that the majority of folks who use it will be using it um, on their phones. And you can see that it's really a sort of friendly, um, almost casual approach to a complicated topic. And we've got good feedback so far from our partners about, about this approach and its uh, effectiveness in communicating. And then this is our first social post. Um, it says, the Vermont Health Information Exchange lets doctors, nurses, hospitals, and pharmacies securely read, share, and add to your medical record across Vermont. It puts your providers on the same page. Learn more or opt out at bthealthinfo.com. And that's sort of the style and tone that we're taking, um, but obviously focusing on different things in each execution. So um, security is more the topic in some executions. Your options are more the topic in other executions. 
So that's just a preview. Um, any questions about the campaign before we move on? Uh, just a question on, I guess, uh, you know, when did you go live and the number of hits you've had? And was that, are you projecting a certain amount? Sure. So the website went live last week. The first time we really uh, did any public messaging about it was at Front Porch Forum Post on Monday. We have analytics set up. Um, I don't think any of us have actually opened that up and counted the hits yet, but um, but we'll absolutely start doing that and we'll report back with, with the traction we get. One of the things that uh, folks often ask is why why now? Why do, why do we launch just before the date? And um, from all of the feedback we got, it was really important to folks that we made sure that the major push happened um, within the month and a half prior to the change in implementation, the implementation of the consent policy, so that there was a call to action at that point versus too early um, in the process where people may or may not um, understand um, that there was a, a need to act. So it was intentional. The one, the one additional um, thing related to stakeholder engagement is we wanted the opportunity to ensure that um, one, at least one more time, and this will be ongoing as, as was pointed out this morning, folks uh, could ask the frequently asked questions about the consent policy and the consent strategy. So we will be holding a um, public hearing on February 4th from 10.30 until noon um, in the Waterbury State Office complex as, as an additional opportunity. We more think more of these types of opportunities to be scheduled in the future. for Vermonters to opt out to reducing the burden on provider organizations and really honestly focusing on the education because that has been historically a weaker area. <clears throat> some of the educational resources that are available, and we touched on these, some of these already, but the hotline is available and we are receiving calls and I'll provide more information about that in a few minutes. The Office of the Healthcare Advocate has a number to call and they have been trained as Maureen mentioned in, and they were trained in December I believe. We have a sample notice, notice of privacy practices which is essentially a paragraph to share information about how um, patients information is being transmitted and organizations we are encouraging them to put this in their disclosures it's not mandatory, but we have had a number of organizations already doing that, so that's positive. <clears throat> Participating healthcare organizations will um, receive educational resources. They can also be a source of education, and those will, that will continue after March 1st. They will have provider uh, patient brochures, they'll have opt-out forms, and those that will continue to collect consent choice will be prepared to do that after March 1st. And the as I mentioned, the patient uh, the consent brochure will be available shortly, and the bthealthinfo.com website is available right now. So the easy opt-out options. Right now, as everyone is aware, the only way to opt out of the VHI, in or out of the VHI, is by visiting a participating healthcare organization in the current policy. In December, we, we at FIDAL trained our staff to be able to collect consent choice, but it would not be effective until March 1st, so we have received a number of those requests and we we're able to do that, but <clears throat> participating healthcare organizations will continue, especially the electronic uh, transmission of consent will continue after March 1st. We also have the hotline which is available and patients can opt out via the hotline after we verify identity and the online form we integrated into the bthealthinfo.com website. And that has work, been working well. After the front porch forum post, we did receive a number of requests. We've also received a number of calls about questions related to um, what is this and um, do EMTs have access to this? 
um, to everything from there to I prefer to opt out. So we have, a, a gamut of, of um, requests and questions. There's also the ability to download and print the form, if that's the preference. People can come in to Vital, they can mail it to us, or even fax it to us. So <clears throat> that takes care of the open, expanding the opportunities for patients to opt out. As far as reducing the burden on, or, on organizations, that has also been a primary focus of ours, and we have been able to configure and audit, essentially, the ability for Vital to support healthcare organizations in the co consent collection process. So that is, that's a huge step forward for us, and we're really excited about it. Um, the healthcare organizations have, we encourage them, obviously, to continue to collect consent, but they do have the ability to educate their patients about the Beehive and refer to Vital for more information and or the Healthcare Advocates Office. So uh, another piece of this that, that's really exciting is that the stakeholders that have been, have been engaged in this process have been fabulous and having more people aware of what this is, is it's very complex to understand, but having more people engaged to support and help answer questions is super important. So we're happy with, with the outcome. Are there any questions? One. And I can't remember, I think you might have told me this, told us this when you came last time, but how do you check identity over the hotline on the phone? And that's a great question. So we have criteria that we've developed to have 95% confidence that someone is who they say they are. And there are elements such as name, date of birth, address, there are other criteria established, and if they match on those, we feel comfortable that they are who they say they are. We lowered the threshold for people to opt out, and primarily due to our great conversations we had with the Healthcare Advocates Office and the ACLU to really determine that it is less dangerous for a person if they choose to opt out and impersonate somebody else than it is for someone who is already opted out to then opt back in. So for people to opt out, we feel very comfortable and confident in our ability to verify who they are and audit if we need to, our own information about the choice. And for those that want to opt back in, we do require a notarized signature. Thank you. You're welcome. That's it. As um, Jenny mentioned, um, looking back at the evaluation, there's methodology uh, listed in the latest report. Um, Mary Kate Molnan is headed, heading up an evaluation committee that um, names these stakeholders, and uh, they are aiming all of their evaluation methods around these questions, um, which can sort of be simplified um, to say, did you receive the, the opt-out message and do you understand it? Um, so as Jenny mentioned, we've fielded questions in the, thank you, uh, in the um, patient experience survey that a number of responses. That will be one method that we'll be using throughout the year, um, but the evaluation committee will be focused on a few more. Um, and the results of that evaluation will be reported out in the next update, the Health Information Exchange Plan, which is due to you all in November. <coughs> Um, so, consent in the health information exchange plan. So when we presented the health information exchange plan to you, as you all know, you asked for um, more information uh, around the, pro the protocols for provider access as sort of um, a replacement to the 2014 policy that memorialized uh, how we managed consent up until today. Um, so um, first I want to thank the staff that worked with us, Michael Barber and Emeryn and Sarah Kinsler. Um, oh, there's always great partnership, but they really helped us understand this request and hopefully come up with something um, that, for, that ensures that we aren't losing any of the topics covered in the 2014 policy, and we are also fully reflecting uh, current state and what Act 53 asked, um, asked of us. So that was uh, resubmitted to you guys a few days ago. Um, and our intention is to continue to use the HIU plan as the basis for all uh, high-level consent protocols and the management of consent or sort of operations as they were uh, will live outside of the HIU plan. So the strategy lives in the plan and operations uh, lives in things like the deep web vital contract. 
Um, oh, I guess just as a, also as a reminder, uh, when we did submit the Health Information Exchange Plan, uh, Carolyn Stone from Lytle emailed over some additional documentation on connectivity criteria that's been included in the update of the Health Information Exchange Plan as well. Um, maybe I'll just stop here and, and ask were there any questions on the submitted addendum or is it helpful if I review the topics? more questions. Okay. <laughs> so I will uh, I'll throw out the topics here for folks who are not on the board and didn't receive it. Um, but again, it's an addendum to outline the protocols for provider access to information in the, the health information exchange. I think those were, yeah, those were all of our topics for today. Okay, questions from the board? I just had one question on, you know, there was a variety of ways to opt out. And what's the timing of, of that? I mean, how do you project how much backlog you might have, if there are forms? And, um... Sure, so uh, I would just want to clarify your question. You're just asking if we have a backlog of information? <coughs> well, or... somebody calls in, or they do an online form, or they do something, I guess, for somebody who was just going to the doctor and then realized, you know, they're now in this and they don't want to be in, how quickly are they out if they go to their doctor? Okay. Like that. Thank you. So our our policy or our operating procedure is really two to three business days to make that request happen. Honestly, it'll happen before that. Typically, unless it happens to be a weekend, um, it may happen that Monday instead of the Saturday. But. Um, that is the turnaround time that we've allowed. We don't anticipate a backlog, to be honest. We are collecting choices right now. Um, they won't be effective if they call us. They won't be effective until March 1st for the policy that's in place currently. But we can still collect their choice. Does that answer your question? Yes. OK. <laughs> it's just one follow up on the, you know, you've said a couple times, if somebody wants to opt out, it won't go in until March 1st, but why not put it in now? I mean, they're not in now unless they opted in, so why wouldn't you put it in now? And so that's a great question. So right now, if that patient visits a participating health care organization, they can do that. If they're not... Um, right now, they're actually default opted out, so they, right. no one can ask this or chart anyway if they haven't been asked. So um, I think it was decided, I'm not exactly sure by whom, it's, um, but that we should stay without an amendment to the current policy that uh, we wanted to stay with the March 1st effectively. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, I believe the last time we were actually here, we had this, this had this discussion um, that the current consent policy that is in effect, um, because the legislature put a date of March 1, that's when the opt-out consent policy goes into place. But I want to assure you that it is effectively the same thing. If someone were to call today, they are currently opted out, and they will continue to be opted out on March 1st. So regard, regardless, effectively, it is the same thing as being opted out now. That's what I think. Yeah, it's just what, that, that question keeps coming up. Technically and legally, it goes into place on March 1, but it, but from the standpoint of a person, they are opted out now and they will be opted out in the future. And then we will assure the continuity of that regardless of whether they communicated that with their provider or they contacted the hotline. Okay, thanks. So I think it was you, Jenny, that said earlier in the presentation that uh, the uh, infrastructure that we put in place heading into March 1st will uh, remain in place after March, well after March 1st. And I'm just wondering if you have a, a sense of the timeline, because at some point uh, you know, this isn't going to be as hot a topic as it is right now, and um, just uh, kind of an atrophy might happen in terms of the mechanisms that people uh, might use to continue to be informed or to opt in and opt out. And I'm just wondering how you see that unfolding, say, in the nine months or a year um, after March 1st. Uh, what, would, what would your infrastructure look like a year from then? Yeah. 
I, I will tell you that as part of this, I may come back to you in November and actually answer that question. We want to learn from the next uh, month and a half of how effective the communication channels are that we're using now. Um, the way that I've always led is to do incremental um, change in everything that we do. So, but that said, with the, when we went out to purchase things like the front porch forum ads, um, we uh, purchased more than we will actually deliver over the next month. And so we plan on continuing to deliver those um, post the implementation. They probably won't be as frequent. Um, in fact, we have at least four that we were gonna do between February, between uh, January 15th this week, or 20th, and, the, and uh, March 1st. Um, so almost one a week. After that, we will probably space them out. But that's the type of media that I believe that we will continue to use um, if we find that it is effective over the next couple of um, months. Because we do believe strongly that while there is this change in the consent policy and it's on our minds, we want to make sure that it stays on Vermonter's minds. What percentage of Vermonters do you believe we we looked into that when we first when we first did it, and it was pretty high, but I can't remember off the top of my head. It's not the majority, um, but oh, I'm going to get the numbers wrong. I'm not going to get. Why don't we get back to you on that? I don't want to don't want to report to that until we get back. Okay. I'd just like to add that when we put the ad out on Monday, on Tuesday, there were 40 interactions. So that gives you some sense that there's a fairly significant presence people are looking at it. And I think the way Front Porch Forum works is that the posts can be made on one day, but if there aren't enough um, posts in that community, it may be delayed a couple of days. So we'll continue to see more, I think, over the next week. So just as a Measuring. And the one thing as a reminder is that's only one of our tactics. We will also continue to work with our providers. Um, and while we were not happy uh, or satisfied with the um, outreach previously as being enough, um, our providers had already hit 47% of Vermonters in terms of asking them about consent. And they will continue to, to work on, um, on ensuring that individuals are informed. So we feel like the combination of several different things will hopefully get to Vermonters. At this point, we'll open it up to public comment. Seeing none, again, very unusual. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. At this point, we'll invite the uh, vital team to come down. And Beth, whenever you're ready, just take it away. I'm sorry for my not graceful entrance. Um, <laughs> you're getting a lot of sympathy from me, I can tell you. <laughs> I am sorry. That means you had a similar incident, I imagine. <laughs> Um, thank you for having us today. I just, uh, for those of you that I have not had the opportunity to meet with yet, I'm Bethany Anderson. I am the new CEO and president for Vital. Um, I've been on board. This is my eighth week. Are you still counting? Do you think? Yes. yes. Um, <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, just the team is here today. Uh, I think you know for a few reasons. One is, um, as you heard from in the team in November, um, we have an updated FY20 budget to present to you, which has changed since the budget you approved in the spring as a result of um, further negotiations and an expansion of the contract with DIVA, which reflects um, a new kind of focus uh, and more efficient investment of the monies that they are putting into health IT. And I think a great opportunity for us to partner and collaborate with some of the other stakeholders um, with the work forward. So Bob Turnell, who you know, will be presenting that for your hopeful approval. Um, following that, we will do our um, regular update, which will include an update by Christopher Shank uh, on the collaborative services um, projects that we have underway um, with some good information about the first one, which has gone um, semi-live and we've seen some positive results from. And then Carolyn Stone will present our operational metrics.
Great, thanks, Beth. Um, good afternoon, I'm Bob Trineau, uh, Vital's Chief, uh, Chief Financial Officer. And I'd like to thank the board for the, their time in reviewing Vital's updated budget this afternoon. I'd also like to thank Agatha Kessler and Sarah Kinsler for their help in uh, getting us to this point. Uh, next slide, please. Just to quickly review the path that has led us here, uh, Vital's budget was approved in June with the condition that Vital return in November to brief the board on the outcome of Vital's negotiations with DIVA on the CY20 contract. The result of the negotiations with DIVA for the CY20 contract includes significant scope of work and represent an increase in the capabilities of the VHI through the collaborative services projects. In addition, the most significant change to the work scope was the addition of a second phase to the collaborative services project. This new project is for the acquisition and implementation of a new data repository and the incorporation of VITAL's homegrown health data management warehouse and the Vermont Clinical Registry into this new data repository. We see this as a vote of confidence by the state following the hard work VITAL has done over the past two years. After our November review, uh, the Green Mountain Care Board has asked us to update our FY20 budget, and that is why we're here. And since November, there have been several significant events that we'd like to share with uh, the Green Mountain Care Board. The first being that VITAL's board has reviewed and approved this new updated FY20 budget and also that the CY20 contract has been executed in December between VITAL and DIVA. Next slide, please. Just uh, for some clarification, VITAL's FY20 um, budget period runs from July 2019 to June 2020, um, while the CY20 contract runs from January 2020 through December 2020. The CY20 contract affects um, our FY20 budget for that period of January through December of 2000, January through June of 2020. The additional work scope and funding of the CY20 contract is the primary driver for the updated budget that you see before you. At the top line, we expect revenue to increase by $1.5 million. This is the result of new work from the new contract adding about $1.9 million of revenue. And this is offset by $400,000 of reduction in revenue <coughs> that was originally forecast for cost sharing of the uh, collaborative services projects. Further, we expect expenses to increase by 1.5 million to cover the cost of licenses, networking costs, and to implement those technologies and for their ongoing maintenance. Overall, we expect to end the year with a deficit of $180,000, essentially the same as our original budget projection. We believe that we have sufficient cash reserves to handle the additional cost expenditures required by the new contract and expect to end the year with about $1.8 million of cash for 84 days. Next slide, please. There are three areas in which the new work scope has been added to the CY20 contract. There are projects that enhance the VHI for things such as connectivity for EMS and emergency services, implementation effort for the new consent management policy, preparation and planning for additional data types, and also a data governance implementation plan. The CY20 contract also contains funding for phase one of the collaborative services projects, such as the universal master patient index, terminology services, and the Rhapsody infrastructure. The acquisition implementation of the new data platform is also included, and this project will replace VITAL's existing health data management warehouse and consolidate the blueprint for health 
helps clinical registry into a new data platform. This is a significant change as it has not only increased the scope of work for the CY20 contract, but changed the assumption on how the projects would be initially funded. The initial funding, the original funding concept from the FY20 budget was for the phase one collaborative services projects to be cost sharing amongst the partners. With the consolidation of the VCR and the HDM, these relationships have changed somewhat as the funding to do the work has now flowed from Diva to Vital, who will be the lead on implementing these collaborative services projects. We expect to do some cost sharing in the future, but the timing will be later than what we originally thought, and maybe with uh, different partners as our capabilities um, become more known in the Vermont health IT ecosystem. Next uh, slide, please. This chart details the new CY20 contract by line item or deliverable. That's the second column of numbers from the left. It compares to the predecessor, um, the CY19 contract line items to show the di differences in the new contract. While some items have remained more or less the same, such as operations, data access, data quality, and connectivity, the basic contract has increased by 400,000 from the new work in consent management, which is 175,000, 75,000 for preparation and planning of it for additional data types, 250,000 for connecting EMS and emergency services, and 40,000 for the data governance implementation plans. In addition, the collaborative services projects add 1.7 million of funding to the CY20 contract. The phase two project, the future data platform, adds two million to the CY20 contract. To project revenue for the updated budget, we time-phased each of the deliverables in the new contract to, for um, the two fiscal years that are affected, FY20 and FY21. And this is shown in the two right-hand columns. So the total for revenue projected for the FY20 contract is 4.1, while the FY21 contract is 4.7 million. In this chart, we're presenting the final audited revenue numbers for FY19, along with the original FY20 budget, which was approved by the Green Mountain Care Board in June, along with the update um, for the budget for FY20 to highlight the, the new work scope um, differences due to the CY20 contract. It should be noted that our original FY20 budget assumed that the CY20 budget for that contract would be less than what it had been in CY19. Further, that the collaborative services partners would pick up the implementation costs of the projects that they were leading. This contract construct has changed since our review in May. The original budget included 400,000 of revenue associated with cost sharing amongst the participants. The assumptions for the FY20 updated budget show that we are projecting 4.1 million in revenue for CY20. And this is the 1.9 million over the original FY20 budget. It includes phase one and phase two. Phase two for us, though, represents more of an unknown at this time as we are in the midst of a vendor selection process as we speak. We expect by the end of the first quarter to have those numbers firmed up and be well on our way um, towards contracting with um, the final vendor. The key, one key departure from the assumptions for the original budget is the degree and timing of the cost sharing amongst the collaborative services partners. 
while this reduces the budget by 400,000 in revenue, it is more than offset by the increased state contract funding of 1.9 million, which the total of these two result in an increase to our FY20 budget for revenue of 1.5 million. Expenses are projected in the FY20 update to be 1.5 million greater than our original FY20 budget. I will discuss this in greater detail on the next chart. Finally, the change in net assets, or otherwise known as net income, for the FY20 updated budget is projected to be essentially unchanged from the original budget which the Green Mountain Care Board approved. Next slide, please. Expenses for the FY20 budget are projected, as I mentioned, to increase by 1.5 million. And this is comprised of an additional 800,000 for consultants to augment vital staff in the performance of the additional work required by the CY20 contract. Because of the short accelerated time frame of these projects, Vital felt that it was important to only bring on staff to address the maintenance of this new functionality and to have consultants do the shorter term implementation tasks. We are adding two positions to our staff, a technical support person and a programmer analyst. In addition, um, there's 154,000 of additional legal support for contracting uh, support in the acquisition of the future data platform, along with supporting and guiding us through uh, the consent management uh, implementation and other projects where legal guidance is needed. There's $157,000 increase to network cost, um, primarily due to uh, implementation of Azure, and, which is a cloud technology and also um, increased cost to our API um, vendor. We have included an increase in education and research, and that is related to implementing the consent management. And there is an increase to help um, Catalyst, which is our VHI hosting software, for the connection to um, the EMS and emergency services project. And finally, we've added a $150,000 contingency, um, which accounts for about 2% of total expenses, to account for the uncertainty and costs in the areas such as the future data platform. Excellent. Changes to Vital's balance sheet are that we expect cash to be about 190,000 lower than originally estimated due to the increase in expenditures for these new projects. Our cash on hand was originally assumed in our FY20 budget to be about 117 days. The new um, updated budget assumes 84. And again, this is driven by the increased expenditures from the new work scope that we've taken on in the CY20 contract. Our WIP, or work in process, has increased by 800,000. And this reflects costs associated with the future data platform, which have been incurred, but have not been recognized as we have not completed the tasks, uh, the implementation tasks of the future data platform until after the end of the fiscal year. There is also a minor change to um, net property and equipment to reflect the acquisition of new computer hardware. And Vitals accounts payable um, is about 400,000 more, again, reflecting the increased expenditures from, this, from the collaborative services process, projects. In, in short, Vitals balance sheet is still strong. Our current cash position is 2.7 million. And we expect our cash flow will be sufficient to cover the new work scope, even though we estimate that our liabilities will increase in this period. Um, this concludes my remarks on the FR20 updated budget. What brought the insurance costs down by close to 19,000? 
financing. We went out with an RFP this summer and we um, solicited local firms and we actually switched um, brokers and were able to lower our E&O insurance um, policy premium by about $20,000. Questions from the board? Uh, I took two. On the, uh, the 400000 cost sharing that's no longer in there, is that just a timing? Um, or, and how many people were you looking at sharing costs with in those collaborative services? Okay. Um, original, the original construct was to share amongst three um, participants, vital, um, Capital Health Associates and One Care. Um, that has since changed. I think it's more of a timing issue. Um, we, I guess, were a little bit more aggressive on when we believe that we could uh, seek um, cost sharing revenue. Um, I foresee that it's going to be something that we are going to um, include in our FY21 budget. But um, given how much work we um, have on the table, um, it more than, through the state contract, it more than covers um, our exposure to the loss of that revenue. And then um, the 150000 contingency, that hasn't been something I don't think you've had in the budget before. I know you put it in when you made this change and you presented that to us you know, a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. But any update on if you think you're going to need that or? I, I don't have an update. Um, in fact, we plan on getting the RFPs in Friday. So um, it's just a, a timing. I wish I could um, have more information about where we'll be um, in terms of the vendor uh, cost for the future data platform. Okay. And if you don't need it, you're just going to drop it to the bottom line? And yeah, that's correct. So I'm looking, um, I think it's a, a slide six, and your 1.508 million in expense increases. And I'm just um, I'm looking at the language that says the addition of 802,000 for consultants to augment by the staff. And I'm just wondering if you can you have had that. There's a lot of moving parts here between fiscal years and calendar years. And I'm just wondering if um, you can give some overview as to what might be base builders here uh, in Vital's budget and what are essentially one time expenditures over the 2020 uh, 21 period. Um. Can I just clarify, you're asking whether there are recurring charges in, in that number or recurring in one time or? Well, I, it's, you know, uh, <clears throat> the language just says the addition of 820,000 for consultants to augment vital staff. And that implies to me that consultants are not permanent. Um, they're that consultants and you're not bringing them on board. But I, I'm just, of that $1.5 million, I'm just trying to set what should we expect should be in your base going forward out of 2020 into 21 and 22? Um, of that 800,000, the majority of that is, or almost entirely is for implementation tasks. Um, I think that we haven't really developed um, a sense for what we'll need in terms of ongoing support from uh, consultants, but uh, we have brought on two additional uh, staff people, one of which was specifically for maintenance of um, the new functionality. So um, in that sense, we were trying to use the consultants to handle the short-term work um, and bring on a firmer uh, a staff position to handle um, maintaining the new functionality. Does that capture? Well, it does. I, I'm just um, um, 
kind of it does. I, you know, obviously it's, it's, a, it's a more detailed picture than that question, but I just know that as the vital budget was developed in, I think, 2017 and 2018, it was done so with the anticipation of building cash for carry forward to sustain um, the budget going forward. And so I, I'm just, in my mind, trying to understand the balance here between you know, the fact that it was a carry forward uh, concept um, and here we might be, uh, uh, might be uh, investing in some ongoing investments that will be you know, feed away that faster absent uh, you know, additional revenue growth. I, I think that once we get um, the vendor selection completed, we'll have a better idea of that because each of those um, offerings will will have a different uh, footprint in terms of what will be required um, to maintain them. Um, it may be, in some alternatives, it may be minimal and it may be that the vendor actually is taking on that role. And in other offerings, it may be the reverse. So until, you know, we, um, take the numbers from the vendors and can put them into a total cost of ownership, we don't really have a sense for what it will look like in 21 yet. But um, we will be bringing that to the board in our next um, budget um, review, which will be coming up, I believe, in May. So we'll have better information at that point because we'll be through the vendor selection and we'll be we'll have contracted with that vendor. So we'll have an idea of what it will take. And uh, just uh, <coughs> given uh, Mike Smith's departure and uh, his assumption of the sector of human services with corrections and issues at Bravo Retreat, um, I'm wondering if he's called and asked if he can come back. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I well, um, we all miss Mike. He was, he was quite a character and, um, and we, we are enjoying getting to know Beth and, um, I'm sure that we could have, we could have some make work for Mike if he were to come back. Um, we could find something. Um, but yeah, I think if you if you asked everybody, he did make a, a big mark on the organization, and you know we wouldn't be where we are uh, today without his um, his leadership. And um, we're all here, um, and we support Beth because um, as our new CEO, she's going to take us to the next level, and uh, we're really excited about that. Any other questions from the board? Okay. Collaborative services. Thank you, Bob. By the way, Mike is known to drop in. <laughs> um, as you know, Vital has been involved in the collaborative services project for some time now, and I'm pleased to share our progress in both phase one and phase two with you today. The three components of the first phase of the collaborative services project are a universal master patient index, terminology services, and enhanced interfacing capability. As the lead for the UMPI portion, VITAL has been hard at work implementing the Verado solution. Testing began in November and last month we completed testing and moved on to a production smoke test. Both terminology services and interfacing are being provided by Curates Innovations a subsidiary of Health InfoNet, Maine's HIE. The collective environments for Term Atlas and Rhapsody were provided to us at the end of last month, and implementation work is currently underway. As an extra update to the Universal MPI project, we are excited to share our preliminary match, res uh, match rates increased over 25% in early January. We will continue sharing our progress as this new capability matures. And as, you, as you've heard a few times now, even today, uh, the second phase of the collaborative services project is called the Future Data Platform. 
As we shared in November, VITAL is working with participants from eight healthcare organizations across the state to select a shared healthcare data platform. This platform will replace the VHI Health Data Management Repository, support Blueprint Clinical Data Analytics, and be available for additional data types in the future. Since our last update, the team has narrowed down to three vendors. Those three vendors gave extensive on-site presentations last month, and we begin performing due diligence. We are currently completing the due diligence, and as Bob mentioned, the RFP responses are due at the end of this week. Once results are evaluated, the group from these eight participants will be recommending a vendor to Vital Leadership as well as Diva Leadership uh, next month. And once that is complete, contracting and implementation can begin. Are there any questions about the collaborative services projects? Thank you for the update. Can you give us a sense of timing in terms of the implementation of the terminology services and the interfacing in phase one? So you mentioned that um, where you are now, but when would you expect to be fully up and running? Uh, we are we are working towards implementing that uh, this month and next month. Uh, there's active work going on right now. Carolyn's team and my team are working closely together to roll that out. I would say we're, the tentative go live right now. I mean, it's all going to depend on how things go. We just got the environments and how testing goes. But the tentative go live right now would probably be the end of April. Thank you. And there might be ways we can phase in some pieces earlier than others. So that's all being worked out with the teams right now. Great. And you never know what comes up in testing, and you don't want to rush it. So exactly, we want this to be right, and um, right. we have an existing system that's working right now. So we're working on making it a clean transition, even if it takes a little bit longer. Yeah, great. You have any questions on collaborative services? Okay. All right. And as we provided before, we wanted to give you an update on our quarterly metrics. Um, so this is the end of the, our calendar year reporting. And you can see we've, we've provided over 900 hours in 2019 to any organization that, that requested help with meaningful use or security risk assessments. Um, we were able to, to handle anyone who, who requested that help. So that's, um, been a great accomplishment this year. Um, in a chart that's very familiar to you all, our consent rate did go up a little bit this month. Um, it had been trending level, but it went up a slight bit in December, and that would be due to the fact that um, when Porter Medical Center and Central Vermont Medical Center switched to EPIC, they are now collecting electronic consent as well. So we saw a slight uptick, but we're looking forward to the day when, on March 1st, when this flips and um, we have a lot more people in. Because 47% is still not the best number for our providers that we're looking to access data on their patients. Um, one of our major uh, goals is getting more data, and that includes both new and replacement interfaces. At the end of the year, we had a target um, of 85 new and replacement interfaces. We completed 121 in 2019. We've also been working on work plans with our clients, trying to, the work plans lay out what is needed to get them to tier two or eventually to tier three. Um, we completed 120 of those, which exceeded our target on that as well. Um, and we did get 28 locations meeting Tier 2 connectivity criteria this year, which is fabulous. And we're looking forward to continuing that work. There are many organizations right now that are working on their work plans to get to Tier 2 in 2020. Um, for point of care utilization, um, we've seen an increase of over 4,000 chart accesses over last year. So we had 41,000 chart accesses this year. Um, we're hoping for more after the consent change in March because they will, when they go to look, they will find more people that have consented in. Um, 
point of care utilization, um, provider results delivery, this is one of those key services that we offer that is kind of invisible to most people. We deliver electronic results for laboratory radiology and transcriptions right into people's EHRs. So when the doctor orders a lab test, it shows up in the EHR for their patient. Um, and we have 469 providers that use this service, and we delivered over 1.4 million results this year. Um, that's an increase. We had 1.3 million last year. So. That is the last of our updates. Any questions on the quarterly metrics? Any questions on the board? Jess? Um, my first question is the consultations around meaningful use and security risk. I'm just curious, what is, I don't need the exact data, but just roughly anecdotally, I'm guessing meaningful use is coming down, that means security risk is coming up, or in terms of the breakdown of what you're really consulting on? Or is it really half and half? Um, I think it, it depends on the organization. We do do a lot of security risk assessments. Um, I think that people like that as a service. I think that we, the plan is we do know that meaningful use is starting to taper off. Um, so we're using the time allocated there to do the security risk assessments and also to help the organizations with um, some data quality work as we work towards you know meaningful use goals dovetail very nicely with a lot of the reform programs and measures that they're trying to work on. So we're trying to make sure that we can look at the organization holistically when we go in and work on all of that but at the same time. But yeah, we are reducing the number of hours that we will, that are contracted for with DIVA in this area next year by, we went from 80 hours a month to I believe 50 hours a month of consulting time. So to reflect that. And this, this, the next question was just around um, the providers that are receiving the results from the labs. Mm -hmm. um, do you have goals in mind, particularly after uh, opt-out comes in, um, around what the, the ideal number you would have for how many providers will eventually be using? So it's 469, I just was wondering, you know, what is your achievable number of providers you can eventually access? Um, I think, you know, this is a service that they have to request. Um, so some, and it also depends on some of the laboratories to participate. Um, so how do we, how do we get both up? <laughs> yeah, um, the, the, the results delivery, I think we'll just continue to do those as requested. Um, we definitely have a backlog of those. So, but we have to prioritize what we can and can't do. They, they require testing when they're first set up with the hospitals, the hospital labs. Um, so that can sometimes present scheduling challenges. Um, so is the backlog that providers want those results, but you haven't been able to do the testing? Okay, so there is demand out there. Yeah, yeah, there is. Um, and you know, the other challenge is we're only contracted for so many a year. So we've been working with the state to prioritize that. Um, one of the priorities that we're talking about this year um, and hasn't been firmed up, but is the designated agencies as they're all switching EMRs. And we're trying to make sure that we align with what the state is doing with that process. Um, so I can't say a target. There are some um, vendors and some labs that have gone, made direct point-to-point -point connections and don't come through our system. Um, I would say I would like to be able to service anyone who wants it. Um, they can also, some providers get their lab results through Vital Access because that's easier for them than setting up um, an EHR connection, which can cost money from their vendor, even if we can do the work for free. So there's a number of factors that go into it. So. I can't really put a target and say I want to get to this number, but I can say I want to be able to service all the demand that's out there. And um, you know, I would, if there was, if I had my way and we had ultimate funding, we would do all of them. Um, the magic wand. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Other questions from the floor? <clears throat> now we'll open it up to the public for comments. 
Hi, my name is Eric Schultz with the Office of Healthcare Advocate. You talked about um, the match rate for UMTI going up 25%, and I'm just curious what the magnitude increase there is, um, as in like what 25% of what? Like what did we start with? So those, um, that number is based off of some defined beneficiary files that we receive. Um, and we were, you know, we were targeting for the organizations that send us beneficiary files. We were able to take those up over, you know, we were in the 60s somewhere and we were able to take them up over 90%. So that's the only way we can, we can effectively measure match rate is when we have a defined population. Mm -hmm. um, if someone can define the population of Vermonters, I'd be happy to tell you <laughs> what we're matching on. Um, but that's kind of an unknown for us. And you know, we're, we're just starting to explore all the capabilities of the new tool now that it is in production. Um, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other comments or questions from the public? Thank you very much. Um, Beth, you're showing a great leadership skill because uh, you delegated so much today. And, uh, <laughs> we're, we're glad that uh, you survived your first meeting at the Green Mountain Care Board. And uh, really excited for uh, your opportunities, as Bob said, to take the organization to the next level. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So at this point, we'll invite uh, Sarah to come down. Everything she does. Um, so for the record, this is Sarah Kinsler, TMCP, uh, Director of Strategy and Operations. At least I know who I am. <laughs> and I'm the Kessler Health, Health Policy Director for the board. So um, thank you. We thought we would just do um, preliminary staff recommendations and a quick review of our analysis together for both presentations um, rather than um, in between. So I will quickly run through the, um, the proposed uh, changes to the 2019 to 2020 HIE plan having to do with consent. As a reminder, we have um, three uh, major oversight responsibilities related to HIE, HIT, and VITAL. The first is to review the state HIT plan, now known as the HIE plan. Um, we reviewed and approved the 2019-2020 plan in November um, on the condition that deeper return in the new year and update to the plan um, to reflect the new opt-out consent uh, model being implemented on March 1st, and they have done that today. Um, in addition, we were charged with reviewing uh, the connectivity criteria for providers connecting to the VHI. Um, the proposed uh, amended HIE plan also includes additional documentation on those 2020 connectivity criteria, which the board had seen in November but wasn't included in that version of the plan. Um, and then lastly, the board is tasked with um, reviewing the vital budget, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, so as a reminder, we used uh, four principles to assess the HIE plan back in November. Um, the star principles here on the slide are the ones that are most re relevant to our conversation today about HIE consent. So first, and I think this is the, the key today, um, is alignment with statutory requirements. Um, Title 18 states that the HIE plan shall include standards and protocols designed to promote patient education, patient privacy, physician best practices, electronic connectivity to healthcare data, and overall a more efficient and less costly means of delivering quality healthcare in Vermont. Um, and effective March 1st, that it shall provide for each patient's electronic health information that is contained in the Vermont Health Information Exchange to be, accessible, to be accessible to healthcare facilities, healthcare professionals, and public and private payers to the extent permitted under federal law, unless the patient has affirmatively elected not to have the patient's electronic health information shared in that manner. So that's enough, but the HIE consent addendum to the HIE plan establishes those standards and protocols necessary to protect patient privacy while complying with statutory requirements, specifically the new opt out model. Um, so staff looked at that is met. Um, and then for the, the third and fourth criteria, um, I, I focused my review on the stakeholder and consumer engagement piece since that was a major focus of Act 53 um, and also is the fourth criteria or part of the fourth criteria of our review. Um, 
So Act 53, um, as Diva described, lays out specific requirements for stakeholder engagement in implementing the opt-out consent model. Um, and Diva and its partners really have worked closely um, with the HIA steering committee, with advocates, with um, representatives of special populations, and with members of the, the general public um, during the implementation to, um, to you know, explore messaging and address concerns that might be out there. Um, these efforts have been described by Diva in their Act 53 implementation reports, which were submitted to the legislature and to the board on August 1st, November 1st, and January 15th. Um, and the board has also heard public comment um, in the, the past few meetings when we've heard these reports um, from advocates and others about that stakeholder engagement. Um, so given this, um, the staff, the preliminary staff recommendation is to approve the revised 2019 to 2020 HIE plan effective March 1st, um, sunsetting the previous consent policy from 2014 on February 29th. Um, so this is pending receipt of public comment and we'll be accepting public comment on this, obviously indefinitely, but um, for the purposes of this vote uh, through Sunday, February 2nd. Uh, any questions on the HIE consent piece or the HIE plan? Questions from the board? Okay. We'll open it up to public for comments or questions. All right, and we'll move on to the vital budget adjustment. Um, so as previously mentioned, the board is also tasked with reviewing and approving vitals budget um, that came to the board in 2015 and was first exercised in 2016. Um, this year we heard, we received vital budget in April, I believe, heard it in May, and put it on it in early June. Okay, so the next two slides sort of summarize the FY20 impact of the updated calendar year 20 contract that Vital just presented. So we pulled out the pieces that were effective in the FY20 um, budget and what you'll be voting on in terms of amended budget order. So first to remind you that this request for an amended budget order reflects the expanded scope of work that Vital is taking on. Um, it's primarily coming from their collaborative services project consent management and the EMS emergency services. And those numbers up there, the FY20 impact of those, those um, projects. The revenue increase, as you just heard from Vital, is $1.5 million over what has already been approved by the Green Mountain Care Board. This is coming um, from state funding, the $1.8 million in increased state funding with the offset of that $400,000, a reduction of $400,000 in that collaborative services, the, the um, cost sharing. So the overall impact is the 1.5 million um, in revenue. On the expense side, there's basically exactly the same increase in expenses, 1.5 million. Um, this is coming from, and this is directly re related to that same expanded scope of work. It's coming from consultant and legal expenses, um, network services, additional staffing costs, and then that $150 in contingency for the unknowns associated with the collaborative services project. So the bottom line is that it has basically no effect on their operating loss. They were expecting to lose um, a little and cover that with their day's cash on hand. Um, you just heard that their day's cash on hand position is being diminished, going from what you originally approved, the 117 days cash on hand, to um, I believe it's 84, yes, 84 days cash on hand. Um, they expect to recover that in their next budget cycle, and the reason it's diminishing so much is because of the timing of the phase two um, of collaborative services. So again, that number is expected to come back up on the, on the, the next budget cycle. So any questions on that? So as a reminder, the board has in the past used um, four criteria to assess vital budget requests, um, and we will quickly look through each of those um, with respect to the budget adjustment. So in terms of transparency, um, vital complied with the initial FY2020 budget guidance um, and has kept us informed about the possibility um, of needing a budget adjustment um, you know, when they present to the board in both August and November. Um, in addition, we'll have a public comment period open through Sunday the 2nd once again. Um, in terms of alignment with HIE plan goals, the adjusted budget will advance the HIE plan goals by supporting projects like the HIE consent implementation and the collaborative services project. 
Um, in addition, there were new process and timeline were developed in partnership with Eva and Vital and were adjusted to accommodate their contracting timeline. Um, and lastly, the board will, um, of course, continue to ensure that written decisions are sufficiently clear. So based on this um, assessment, the preliminary staff recommendation would be to approve the adjusted vital budget as presented um, with the condition that, uh, maintaining the condition that we have the original budget order that vital continue to come in and present quarterly, which they have done, um, even when it's not been required. Um, and again, this would be pending public comment received through February 2nd. We're scheduled to vote that first week of February. Yeah, we're scheduled to vote on February 5th. Any questions from the board? Robin? I have one question. So um, I would assume that governance and operations would also include updates on the consent implementation. So I don't think it necessarily means a change to your recommendation, but I just wanted to voice that assumption. Absolutely, and that's something that we could definitely ask the order. Um, this is, uh, this condition has been in, in place since the second budget cycle now, um, and really is intended to express that um, we've requested that vital provide us with the, the same kind of operational metrics um, ongoing uh, so that the board can have a, a consistent set of metrics to, um, to compare over time, but we can certainly add uh, updates on consent implementation and other key projects. So will that include the de-identified data statement? I don't, I don't understand your question. I don't understand. So I, I thought there was going to be a recommendation as part of the uh, implementation from DIVA um, for the change that um, clarified protection of uh, everyone's data. Absolutely. So in um, in the proposed amendment to the HIE plan, um, there is in that uh, in that consent addendum, there is a line specifying um, prohibiting sale of de-identified data in the VHI. So that's contained in the HIE plan amendment. Okay, I'll take a look at that language, but I hope it's more than just sale. Because I hate to see something being given away for free. I believe it's commercial use. Okay. But we can double check on that and if needed we'll confer with the Diva team to better understand. Any other questions from the board? Seeing none, any uh, public comment? White then. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of the day.